Hey everybody, we're back talking about the digestive system, uh, pointing out a few important structures that we need to know, as well as some important functions. I want to point out, first of all, that we're going to start with where uh, food begins the digestive process, which of course is in the oral cavity. So we want to start with ingestion. We know that food goes into the mouth, and one of the primary things that helps us to digest food is saliva. We know that saliva is produced in three different salivary glands. The first gland that we have, of course, is our parotid gland, which you can see is actually located around in the parotid area. And the substance that is produced by the parotid gland has to travel out of the gland itself and through a duct, which happens to be known as the Stinson's duct. The Stinson's duct then carries the salivary uh, secretions through the cheek and into the oral cavity. So uh, once we see that, we have to go outside a bit and we'll go inside the mouth where we can use this giant jaw model looking like it was snatched out of the mouth of King Kong or something. And we can see the different teeth that are used to digest the food. Now, of course, if you start at the back, you've got the molars, which are here. Here are your wisdom teeth. These guys are used to grind uh, food. And then we see our friends here, the premolars. And then after the premolars, you see this particular tooth, which is known as the cuspid. And then we see these guys up here, which are known as the incisors. And these guys are used for mechanical uh, breakdown of food. So that's mechanical digestion. But if you look closely here, you're going to see one gland here, which happens to be known as your submandibular gland. And then if you look here, you're going to see that this particular gland is known as the sublingual gland. Now, of course, both of those are getting in on the action to produce saliva for your digestive tract. We see that this particular submandibular gland has a duct that's going to carry its salivary uh, secretions out and into the oral cavity. This is known as the Wharton's duct. And then if you take a look in here, and this gets people a lot of time, so let's zoom in here just for a moment, see how close we can get. Yeah, right in there. People think when they're looking in image books that the yellow stuff happens to be the ducts of the sublingual gland, but that's not it. The ribbonous ducts are talking about these guys right here. If you see the little pink portions that are extending up, those are the ribbonous ducts. And if you see the holes that correspond with them, these are the openings for these ribbonous ducts. And so their secretions port through the ducts and into the mouth. So, one of the enzymes that we have to know that's coming out of our saliva happens to be salivary amylase. The salivary amylase specifically breaks down uh, carbohydrates, it starts carbohydrate digestion in the mouth. Another enzyme that's released is also known as lingual lipase, which is targeting lipids, henceforth the name lipase. Now, if you don't already know this, remember that when you have an ASE at the end of a word, that tells us that that's probably an enzyme. So when we hear uh, salivary amylase, that tells us that's, a, that's an enzyme. And lingual lipase, that happens to be another enzyme. And lingual lipase is targeting lipids. Now, the, uh, there's still the debate out as to just how much digestion lingual lipase can actually do because there's uh, debates on how pH affects the enzyme and so many different things like that. But let's just remember that lingual lipase is released in the mouth and that we really don't see the majority of our lipid uh, digestion take place until we get to the small intestine. And judging by this model, we're definitely not there yet. So let's continue on to the next model, which happens to be this digestive tract model. And we can see that the food is going to exit the oral cavity. And when it exits the oral cavity, let's zoom in there just a little bit. 
is going to go through three phases of deglutition and we know that deglutition means swallowing so we have uh, the first three phases like the first phase is the buccal phase and that's uh, the food moving from the oral cavity and then it arrives into your pharynx which is the pharyngeal phase and then it passes from the pharynx into the esophagus which happens to be the esophageal phase and um, I see that it's zoomed in a bit and didn't even know that I'm glad I decided to take a look back to see what was going on but what's supposed to happen here is we go through the three phases let me repeat one more time because I don't know where it got messed up but the oral cavity is where it's at the buccal phase the pharyngeal uh, phase is when it enters into the pharynx or the throat and then we get to the esophageal phase which is where the food enters into the esophagus. Now you got to remember something. The esophagus does nothing to help us digest food. Absolutely nothing. For those of you who are old school and in that particular age bracket you guys remember the old BET joint with Rachel on there and she would say nothing. So there's nothing happening in the esophagus. Believe that. So we get here into the stomach and this is where we're going to see a lot of protein digestion. Food enters in through the cardiac sphincter and passes here in this initial area where there's the cardia. We can see the fundus of the stomach. We can see the body. We can see the antrum and we can see the pylorus and there's the pyloric sphincter. Now the thing we need to remember chemically about the stomach is that in between the rugiae, which look like the Freddy Krueger wrinkles down here, are little gastric pits. The gastric pits contain several different cells that produce several different secretions. Some of these cells produce uh, mucus. The parietal cells that are there are actually producing hydrochloric acid and the chief cells, or excuse me, uh, yeah, the parietal cells are producing hydrochloric acid and the chief cells are producing pepsinogen, which pepsinogen will convert to pepsin once it's out into the lumen. So the primary nutrient that's broken down in the stomach is going to be protein. Well, once that food passes through the pyloric, pyloric sphincter, it then enters into the next organ, which is going to be the small intestine. Now this is where it starts to get kind of tricky for some people. You have to remember that the small intestine is made out of three segments. There's the duodenum or the duodenum, you know, potato, patata, however you want to pronounce it. Then there's the jejunum and then there's the ileum. The duodenum or the duodenum is only somewhere around 10 inches long. It's nicknamed the mixing pot. And it's nicknamed the mixing pot because that acidic chyme that just left the stomach now enters into it. And so we're going to mix the acidic chyme that just left the stomach. We're going to mix the secretions that are going to be released by the pancreas, which is down in the corner here. You can't really see it from the camera angle, but we'll show you in just a moment. The pancreatic secretions as well as the bile that is being released by the gallbladder. So since we're over here, let's start with the bile that's released from the gallbladder. Now what we have here is a liver and the liver is actually flipped upside down. So uh, technically, uh, if we were looking at this in a real person, what they've done is they flipped the liver up just like an old school garage door. You remember the old garage doors that used to flip up? Not like the ones that just automatically roll, but these guys are just flipping up and so you're able to see the inferior portion and the posterior portion of the liver at the exact same time on this model. The liver produces bile, but the gallbladder stores it. And the reason why you store bile is because you use bile in lipid digestion. There is a process that your food undergoes when it's exposed to bile and it's called emulsification. It kind of works like Dawn, you know, Dawn liquid soap because your bile contains salts in it that act like a detergent. It actually spreads the lipid molecules and the fat molecules out which allow the enzymes that are going to be coming from your pancreas and your small intestine to further break down your fats so that you can actually absorb them. So, it gets broken down, uh, but that doesn't happen until you release that bile. So that bile is released from the gallbladder and then travels through the cystic duct, which is here. 
Then after it travels through the cystic duct, the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct merge and they form what's known as the common bile duct. And it travels through the common bile duct and then it's going to empty into the small intestine. Meanwhile, your friend over here, the pancreas, the guy that you just can't live without, is doing his own thing as well. So when we look at the pancreas, we'll see that the pancreas is working the life of a double agent because the pancreas is not only making hormones for the endocrine system, but he's also making enzymes for the digestive system. So cells in the pancreas, exocrine cells in the pancreas are producing enzymes like pancreatic lipase, pancreatic alpha amylase, pancreatic proteases, pancreatic peptidases, pancreatic nucleases, um, yeah, dude's got enough aces to be Trump tight. But anyway, so all these different enzymes are being produced in the pancreas and they're being secreted and they're passing through what's known as the main pancreatic duct. As they pass through the main pancreatic duct, they'll continue on down here and then they will pass out through a small hole known as the major duodenal papillae. Meanwhile, the pancreas also has to make a secretion to help out with the acidic chyme that just arrived in the duodenum or the duodenum. This is going to be released in the form of bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate ions are going to travel through the, the accessory pancreatic duct and then they pass out through what's known as the minor duodenal papillae. So if we were to get a close up here, we could follow everything. There's the main pancreatic duct and everything passes through the main pancreatic duct and then we're going to see where the main pancreatic duct is the large white structure that goes uh, more goes down and then if we zoom in really close you can see yeah just about let me get my focus focus ain't working if you'd like to donate to new technology that would actually make this video actually work, please send your money to. All right, yeah, there's a small hole. You can barely see it in the image because it just doesn't want to zoom in. Let's turn it towards you just a bit. There we go. And you'll be able to see the major duodenal papillae and just above it, you can see the minor duodenal papillae right there. And so both of those secretions are coming into the small intestine along with the bile, along with the acidic chyme, which are all the acidic contents of everything that was digesting in your stomach at that time. And they all mix together in the duodenum or the duodenum at the same time. And that is why that section or segment of the small intestine is known as the mixing pot. Well, after you created the mixing pot and everything's mixed together, it continues to pass on through the small intestine. And we get right here to where this portion, the first segment of the small intestine ends and the second segment of the small intestine begins, which is known as the jejunum. And if we just move back over to here, we can see where things are passing through the small intestine. Now, this is where things get a little tricky and you probably want to refer back to your textbook on this one because what happens is further digestion needs to take place for all those different nutrients. This is when we get to the small intestine and we get to the jejunum and we see where these things called brush border enzymes come into play. You've actually heard of brush border enzymes before, even if you don't think you have. Things like maltase and lactase and sucrase. These are brush border enzymes. Enzymes that are lining the borders or the walls of the small intestine. So as food passes through the small intestine and rubs against the walls, these enzymes get into the food and they continue to break it down even more so that you can absorb it into your body circulation. 
So maltase happens to be an enzyme that breaks down maltose and sucrase breaks down sucrose and lactase breaks down lactose. So when someone says that they are lactose intolerant, it means that they are lacking the enzymes in their digestive tract to help them break down dairy products. Uh, beware of those people who talk about being lactose intolerant and they just don't like drinking milk but they'll eat you out of house and home with your ice cream and they'll order their own three cheese pizza and eat it by themselves. So that food begins to get broken down there in the small intestine and then it passes from the jejunum and gets into what's known as the ileum. The ileum is the longest part of the small intestine and as it passes on through we can see where the ileum begins to run into a very 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 important structure known as the ileocecal sphincter and this sphincter which is located just right here is a type of valve that makes sure that when substances pass out of the small intestine and into the large intestine that they do not go back that is a bad bad very bad thing that's something we don't want. So substances pass out of the small intestine into the large intestine and the large intestine does not really chemically break down anything. He more concentrates on reabsorption of any water that you use during the digestive process. So what happens here is the cecum makes sure that he compacts, he acts like a trash compactor, compacting any substances that is uh, entered in from the small intestine these substances are now turned into more fecal matter the bacteria in your large intestine then continue to feed on any of the carbohydrates or any nutrients that remain the bacteria in your large intestine then begin to create vitamins which are actually used uh, by your body you absorb those vitamins uh, we can see all the different parts of the large intestine there was the if we zoom back out there was the cecum, the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure, the transverse colon, the splenic flexure, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and then the last portion would be the rectum, which is there simply for temporary storage, and then the anus. And uh, I think it would be appropriate to say that this is the end.